All right, well, welcome and good evening. Uh, if you're just joining us on the video, you've missed one of the best parts, which is our prayer time. And uh, so you definitely should join us. Um, you know, go to allegiance to the king.org and contact us through the contact email there or find us on Facebook, allegiance to the king Facebook group. And uh, uh, or Christian Virtual Fellowship has a Facebook page as well. And you can find how to get connected uh, to us there as well. Uh, but we appreciate you watching the videos and hope you get a lot out of them. So tonight is our last uh, installment on the Sermon on the Mount series. We're, we're finally at the uh, end of that. And I don't know about you, but I, I certainly have gotten a lot out of the series, both the, the stuff that I've learned uh, in preparation for teachings that I've done, as well as teachings from, from others. Um, and it's just been a really big blessing. I've really enjoyed the, uh, the, the series a lot. And so tonight, we've got the last little bit we're going to do on, um, i tell you what, let me, let me bring my PowerPoint up here. All right. Can everybody see that? Great. This up here. Oh, that is not what I meant to do. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, so tonight, whoops. Um, well, there we go. So tonight we're, we're going to do two things tonight. We're going to cover the last little bit, uh, which is the parable of the two houses. And we're going to summarize uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to kind of recap the Sermon on the Mount. I want to show you that the Sermon on the Mount really can be boiled down to just a few things. And, and really, you can kind of have those in mind as the categories that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it would help us if we, if we recognize the categories of the Sermon on the Mount, I think it would help us to apply them, which is the critical piece that we're, uh, we're, we're dealing with tonight, which is the parable of the two houses and making sure that we, we actually do these things. So first, let's dig in to uh, the parable right at the end. This is Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. I'm actually going to tack on the last two verses of the chapter as well, which um, are, excuse me, some commentary by, by Matthew. Um, but the... Uh, uh, so we'll include that little bit, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. So here's what it says. Oh, let me move my video over there. Uh, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So he does have authority, and he taught with authority, and we need to listen to his authority. And so we see this, this parable here about the, the wise man and the foolish man building, uh, each building a house, the wise man on the rock, the uh, foolish man on the sand. And the reality is this is not, this is not a very difficult parable to understand. Um, it's actually pretty easy. <laughs> um, it's, you know, because he tells you, what the parable is about. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared, right? So we know what this, this parable means. We don't have to guess at it. The, the wise man building his house on the rock is the, the person who um, not only hears the words, but acts on them. Not only hears the message, but acts on them. And the foolish man is the man who builds... Uh, house on the sand, is the one who hears the words but does not act on them. And the, 
Um, one, one thing that's important to understand is right before this, uh, he, uh, Jesus is talking about judgment. He's talking about um, the you know, false prophets. He's talking about people who come to him in the judgment saying, Lord, Lord. And, and he says, I didn't know you. Get away from you, you workers of lawlessness. And, um, and, and they appear to be believers. They appear to be people who heard the words, right? And this is the point that he's making because he just, he's following this up just from that last passage where he's talking about, beware of these guys who seem like they are, they're with you, but they're really not. And they're really workers of lawlessness. And, um, and they may even appear to do things like prophesy and miracles and stuff like that. And preaching in his name. These are people who appear to be followers of Christ, but the reality is they, they have built their house on the sand because they're not acting upon the words of Jesus. And so one of the things we want to, we want to understand is that the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house. The, the rain falling, floods came, the winds blew. That's the judgment. That's what Jesus is talking about. They built, two people built these houses and when the judgment came, only the house that was built on the rock, that is the, the person who actually acted upon Jesus' words, is going to make it through that judgment. So that's the, that's the idea. So just, you know, thinking about the house of the sand are those who listen to and even uh, possibly accept his teachings, but do not obey them. The house on the rock are those who listen, accept, and obey Jesus' teachings and commandments. And so the final exhortation of the Sermon on the Mount, the final whole thing of the Sermon on the Mount is a call to obedience. The last thing he says is you have to obey. You, got, you can't just listen. You actually have to act. You have to do. You have to obey what I've just told you, right? So that's what Jesus is telling us at the end. And he's saying, if you don't do that, even if you sort of had the veneer of being a Christian, um, maybe even doing acts of a Christian in the sense of spiritual things, it doesn't matter because you have to act on the words that he's given in this sermon. So let's look at what did he tell us, right? What are these things? What is the rock? right? So the sermon is the rock. And we want to build our house on that rock, which means we need to act on the message of this sermon. So let's take a look at that. So we're going to summarize the Sermon on the Mount. I think you'll find this interesting that it basically it, we're going to see that the Sermon on the Mount, even though it's three chapters long, and there's a lot of stuff all packed in here, it really boils down to just a few things. And that kind of makes it easy to sort of peg in your mind. If you remember these few categories, you, you'll get the whole Sermon on the Mount. All right. So the first part is the introduction. And, um, you know, this is back in chapter five. We saw that Jesus lists off the characteristics of the kingdom uh, of kingdom people, people who are under the new covenant. This, um, this is a... You know, blessed are the, the uh, poor in spirit, and blessed are, are um, uh, uh, you know, the humble, and, uh, you know, those who mourn, and, you know, all that, that good stuff. So that list there, Jesus is kind of laying out, you know, these are the characteristics of kingdom people. And then he goes on to say that, um, you know, he, he's saying, don't think that I've come to um, abolish the law and the prophets, right? I, I haven't, right? In fact, his message is that we are to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? And he's going to teach us how to fulfill the law and the prophets. That is how to keep God's commandments, right? And he's going to say that, that being salt and light to the world that that's what he's trying to teach us is how to be, um, how to carry out God's message and plan correctly in the world. 
And so fulfilling the law and the prophets is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And you don't want to think of the law and the prophets as the Mosaic law. It can be easy to confuse those things. But hear, hear what Jesus is saying. The law and the prophets. The prophets are not the Mosaic law. And even when he says the law and the prophets, right? When he says the law, that's the books of Moses, right? That's the whole thing there. Well, you've got a whole book there before the Mosaic law, right? When you hear that phrase, the law and the prophets, you want to be thinking about God's law, right? The whole thing, the way in which he's commanded us to be, right? And that may manifest slightly differently under different covenants, but within all of the covenants is this idea that God has for how he wants us to be, and that is fulfilling the law and the prophets, keeping God's commandment. All right, so what we're going to see is that the Sermon on the Mount, the message of how to do that, covers four areas, four specific areas of how you can fulfill the law and the prophets. That is, here's the important thing, how to be kingdom people. So he, taught, he told us the characteristics of kingdom people, right? And then he's, and he's going to say, you as kingdom people, you need to have those characteristics. And, and by being kingdom people, you're going to fulfill the law and the prophets. You're going to be salt and light to the world. Here's how to do it, right? Four, four areas. All right, so let's dig into these. So area number one, is examples that Jesus gives of fulfilling the commandments, right? That were under the law, right? So he's going to talk about some of the commandments under the law, things that certainly would apply at, at, under other covenants, things that even if there is no law concerning it, they would still, God is still expecting mankind to do these things. For example, you know, do not murder, right? Uh, that I, I don't think that's just a mosaic law thing, right? Even though we find it there, I, I, I think God doesn't want us to murder, has never wanted mankind to, to murder. But what Jesus tells us is he's going to give us the fulfilling part of that commandment, which is don't even have contemptuous anger. And Jesus even goes beyond that, where he's going to say, if you know that your brother has contemptuous anger against you, your brother is in danger of going to hell for that. You need to go rescue your brother. You're the only one who can. He's got the contemptuous anger for you. Go do whatever you need to do to rescue your brother from that. That is fulfilling the law and the prophets, right? That, so this is an example. So you want to think, these are examples that Jesus is giving us of how to do that, how to be salt and light, how to be kingdom people, how to be people under the new covenant, how to be people who fulfill the law and the prophets, right? And so the first thing, going to use some of the commandments that all the people listening would be very familiar with, but he's going to really help them understand the message behind it that they have to carry out. This is what is meant by your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, of the scribes and Pharisees, right? You can't just not murder people. You have to, have, you ha have to not have contemptuous anger for people right? And then adultery, he goes, he goes to, to show you don't, to, to fulfill the law of prophets, you don't even allow lust in your heart, much less adultery. Fulfilling the law of the prophets is not even having lust in your heart, right? Then he goes on to divorce and essentially says, don't get divorced. You cause all kinds of problems when you do that. You destroy things when you do that, right? You cause the other person to commit adultery, and there's, a, there's a, a theme throughout this that we're, that we're going to pick, that you pick up as you look at these examples, which is self-sacrifice, that we are to sacrifice ourselves, our own rights, in order to help other people. In other words, I sacrifice, you know, the idea of the right in my mind to have my own thoughts. I mean, sure, I shouldn't commit adultery right? Well, but, you know, don't I have the right to my own thoughts? God says, no, no, you don't. Don't do that. Self-sacrifice those thoughts, right? And, you know, don't have contemptuous anger. But Jesus flips that, remember, 
the actual message that he says there is if your brother has contemptuous anger against you, do something about that. Self-sacrifice so your brother doesn't go to hell, right? Don't get divorced. Do what you need to do to make that work. Self-sacrifice. Vows, let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Keep your word. Even if it hurts you, keep your word. Don't take revenge. <clears throat> Bless and give. The, you know, uh, this is about vengeance. Uh, the, you know, obviously you're going to have, if you're not going to take vengeance, you're going to have to sacrifice for that. Right. And then finally, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. There's the, you know, the idea of the, the old Testament commandment. Now the old Testament commandment was love your neighbor, not hate your enemy, but had, be had become love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Right. And Jesus says, no, love your enemy. Right. The ultimate in self-sacrifice is love your enemy. Right. So, the self-sacrifice that he's teaching about, the, the idea behind the commandments, that self-sacrifice behind these commandments is fulfilling the law and the prophets. So that's, that's, that's the first category uh, that, uh, that Jesus is going to cover. And we want to get that concept in our head, that self-sacrifice. We fulfill the law, we fulfill the commandments through self-sacrifice. Part two. Don't practice your righteousness to be lauded by others, right? So that's the second category of how you fulfill the law and the prophets. First is giving, right? So he's going to give three, uh, three examples of not practicing your righteousness to be lauded by others, giving, praying, and fasting. So first is giving. Don't give to be honored, right, by others. You need to give in secret so you'll be honored by God, right? So, you know, don't, when, when you're going to give, put out of your mind getting anything from other people, you know, do it, do it as much as possible in secret uh, because then you're going to get a reward. Then you are fulfilling the law and the prophets. Then you are a kingdom person. You are helping by giving, but you're not expecting in return. Again, a kind of self-sacrifice, right? The, in the end, it's really, you know, Jesus's exam whole example is that of self-sacrifice. But again, we don't want to practice our righteousness uh, uh, before others in the sense of we're looking for them to honor and uplift us for what, what our deeds of righteousness, right? So second is praying. Don't pray to be seen and admired. Pray in secret. Same kind of concept. But then he also goes on to say about, you know, this whole idea of practicing your righteousness uh, in front of others to for them to oh, wow, how great is, you know, John's prayers. Uh, he's so good at prayer and, you know, all that kind of stuff because I really put a lot of efforts into my prayers. I'm going to make them long and flowery and all this kind of stuff because I want other people to know how good I can pray. You know, God knows what you need. So he says, don't, don't pray long, drawn-out prayers. This obviously was something that was going on at the time. And so don't do that, right? Go, God knows what you need, so keep it short. So you can pray for a lot of things, being sure to forgive others just as you pray for forgiveness, right? He makes a big point of that at the end of this, that little section. And so the idea is, uh, again, you, you, this is not about you, right? Um, and God already knows, but God wants you to pray. So pray for as much as you can, go through a lot of different things and uh, cover all these different areas. Start off with thanking God and blessing him, right? end it with, you know, praying for his kingdom, you know, that kind of stuff. And so that, uh, um, that idea that prayer is not supposed to be about us, right? It's supposed to be about others. Think about, you know, I, you know, you're, you're praying for God to forgive you, right? That's about you. But he says, but you better make sure you're forgiving others, right? So, and then the third one is fasting. Don't fast in order to be noticed. Fast in secret where God will notice and reward you. So the second category is don't practice your righteousness uh, with pride. Right? So this, this, this category is dealing with some pride. We need to be um, set aside our pride. We need to be humble. It's very humble if nobody knows that I'm giving and I, I, I'm out there praying constantly and that I, I'm fasting in order to, to dedicate 
uh, some time to God uh, of not eating anything so that, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's like a fasting is a kind of sacrifice, right? So I'm sacrificing to God in that way. And so if I'm doing it for others, you know, to show off, that's a pride thing. And so we want to be really careful about that. And I won't go into this tonight. It's for another time. But you know what? Pride is a funny thing because it's the one sin that you probably don't know that you have, right? If you have read the Bible, if you know what God considers sin and you're stealing, you know you're sinning. If you are committing adultery, you know you're sinning, right? If you are greedy, you know you're sinning. You know all those things. But pride actually blinds the person to the fact that they have the sin. So the problem is you can be, um, you can have pride in an area and not realize that you have it and it's actually sin in your life. And so here's three categories that certainly at the time and, and could be today is um, that we've got pride in our acts of righteousness and we end up doing it for show for others to look at how good we are and we end up sinning in the process. So don't practice your righteousness to be exalted, honored, or lauded by others. Third one. Store up your treasure in heaven, not on earth. So quite a long section here in part three of fulfilling the law and the prophets. Uh, we're going to um, cover a big section uh, that has to do uh, around money and material things. So the first part uh, is uh, don't hoard up wealth um, because it will be lost. You know, it's fleeting and it's not what's important. Um, you know, if you have wealth, you should do good things with it. Um, but, but we don't want to be focused on it. Jesus tells a whole parable about that, about a guy who's all planning and all this, oh, I'm going to make bigger barns and make more money and all this kind of stuff. And then he dies, right? And so we don't want to do that. We, we want to store up treasure in heaven because it will last forever. In the second piece, this has to do with the, you know, having the evil eye. Um, don't be greedy. Be generous. Pretty straightforward. Don't be greedy. Be generous. Third, you can't serve both God and money, so serve God. If you're doing these things, if you're hoarding up wealth and you're greedy and stuff, you're serving money. And so we want to be conscious. Are we storing up treasures here um, either because we're trying to hoard up wealth or because we're greedy, we, we love all this, these material things that we want and we desire, right? So think about this, this, you can't serve both God and money is sort of a pivot point in the two points uh, uh, or the, 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 the two sides of what Jesus is going to teach about the subject. You can't serve both God and money. And so the first part is more about the greedy part, hoarding up wealth and being greedy. You can't serve God and money if you're that way. The second part, don't be anxious about the material cares of life. Well, that's not exactly hoarding up wealth and, and being greedy. That's worry and anxiety, anxiety about, you know, oh, where's this going to come from? And uh, gosh, I got to do this and I got to do that. And oh, I, you know, I got to do all these things in order to, to make sure that I'm taken care of, that I've got all my needs met. And he says, God knows what you need. So stay focused on his kingdom, seeking it first. And God will take care of your needs. Don't have the kind of anxiety that the world has about material things. You know, we're not talking about greed or hoarding up wealth because I, I, I want the wealth. We're talking about being anxious about making sure I've got all those things taken care of because if I don't, I might go without and da, da, da. Okay. That's not serving God. That's serving money. So we want to seek... Uh, God's kingdom first and recognize God's going to take care of that. And finally he says, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on the day at hand, right? Um, stay focused on the day at hand and what God wants us to do right now. 
right? What can I do right now to further God's kingdom? Now, it doesn't mean that we don't work and we don't earn. That, that would be foolish and silly, right? But we don't want to hoard wealth and be greedy, and we don't want to be anxious. We want to trust and rely on God, no matter what we go through. So that's, that's number three of our, our four things. Store up treasure in heaven, uh, not on earth. Serve God, not money. The fourth thing is using proper judgment toward people or about people, right? Don't, first thing he says is don't use your own standard of judgment in judging others, for you will certainly fail the standard, right? This is the, you know, getting the log out of your own eye um, before you try and get the speck out of your brother's eye, that, that we don't want to, to have our own standard and judge others by that standard because there's no way we're going to live up to even our own standard, right? That, and what's going to happen is we are going to be hypocrites if we're doing that. Uh, second is don't be without judgment towards others because you will regret it. This is the throwing your pearls before swine, uh, you know, that, that, that little section there. It, it, Jesus is countering what he just said. He says, he starts off, judge not lest you be judged. It's a kind of a powerful arresting statement. And people love taking that out of context and throwing at other people who are, are judging them. Don't, you know, judge not lest you're judged, right? Well, I, a couple of verses later, Jesus says, but do judge, right? And, and so we really need to get, and Jesus is gonna, he's gonna give us um, this sort of thing where he says, don't judge, you know, because you're gonna fail the standard anyway, and you got your own problems, don't judge. Do judge, because there's bad people and you need to judge them, right? And, and then he tells you how, right? He says, here's how you do this. You need to ask God to give you the proper judgment toward people. He will only give you the judgment that is good, right? So we don't want to go by our own thinking and our own standards and our, uh, you know, oh, that, you know, that person, blah, 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 because that's how I'm thinking. Maybe it's culturally how I'm thinking. Maybe, I don't know, just you know, whatever it is, right? I, I'm, I'm going to judge that person. And especially I'm judging somebody that I've got, and I've got a, even a bigger problem in my own life. Well, that's pretty prideful. That's certainly not humble. Um, but I don't want to just take the attitude of never judging because that's just really stupid. Um, so we need God's judgment, right? So we got to see God's judgment. We look for God's standards, uh, which we find in the Bible, right? So we do know at least to a certain extent, um, what good judgment looks like uh, towards people. Uh, we find a lot of stuff in Proverbs about that, but it's more complex than that. We need to ask God directly. We need to go to God in prayer and expect that we will get answers about how to navigate between these two things. The not judging because we got our own problems and judging because you have to, or you will regret it, it will be bad, right? So how do we navigate those two waters? We go to God and we get wisdom from God, the exact thing that Solomon asked for and, and received, and God was super pleased that he was you know, recognizing that he was not going to be able to judge properly and he needed God's wisdom. All right, so that's number four. The whole thing wraps up in Matthew chapter seven, verse 12. In everything therefore, Treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. You see how this ties together with our, uh, when he began this whole thing back in, in Matthew chapter five, and he's talking about being salt and light, and he's talking about, um, you know, fulfillment of the law and your righteousness being better than that of the uh, scribes and Pharisees. And then he launches into the how to do that. He goes through these four categories and then he wraps the entire thing in the bow of in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you for this is the law and the prophets. This is how to fulfill the law and the prophets is treat people the same way you want them to treat you. And generally speaking, if you do that, if you treat somebody uh, the way that you want to be treated, um, you're going to be doing all the things he talked about. 
I'll give you the, probably the best example of what he's talking about here is loving your enemy. Well, what would you like your enemy to do? What, how do you want your enemy to treat you? Do you want your enemy to treat you badly and uh, with malice, uh, undermining you and attacking you? Is that how you want your enemy to treat you? No, I bet you want your enemy to treat you with love. I certainly do. So I can easily fulfill the law of the prophets by loving my enemies, which is just treating them the way I want to be treated, right? And again, you can see in this a kind of self-sacrifice. If I'm going to treat them the way I want to be treated, despite how they might be treating me, that's a kind of self-sacrifice. Uh, after he gets through the four categories, he gives us some warnings, right? And, uh, and these are the warnings that he gives us. He says the way into the kingdom and its promise of eternal life is not the easy way. It's the hard way. And most people are not willing to follow the narrow way. If you think about what we just learned in the Sermon on the Mount, this makes total sense. What I just talked about, how easy is it to love your enemy, to truly love your enemy and treat them how you want to be treated? That is really, really hard. And most people are not going to be willing to do that, right? How many people, instead of taking vengeance, maybe even righteous vengeance against someone who's wronged them, instead of that, bless them, do good for them? The narrow way is truly a narrow way. Second, beware false prophets. And I'd like to add, and false teachers, right? Um, that it applies just as much to false teachers as it does to false prophets. They will appear appealing, this is in the, in the sheep's clothing, right? They will appear appealing both in word and in action, right? Because they look pretty good doing the prophesying and the, the miracles and whatnot. They look pretty good. Word and action. Maybe they're even preaching the gospel and carrying out uh, these, these acts of spiritual power. And so it looks pretty good. But in truth, they're wolves who practice lawlessness. So he tells us to look at the fruit and that by their fruit, we'll be able to distinguish them from true spiritual leaders, right? So we look at the fruit and does the fruit look like the fruit of the Sermon on the Mount? Is it that fruit? Or is it some other kind of fruit? I think one of the ways that you get to see this, the difference between a false teacher and a true uh, teacher is when they come under pressure. Because what happens is when you come under pressure, whatever's inside of you comes out. And I had a, a, a friend of mine teaching once, uh, taught this, this, this neat little visual of a sponge. And the idea was that you have this sponge and a sponge, you, you put it in something, you squeeze it, you let it go, it soaks up everything that was there. And you might hold up the sponge and, and just, if you're not squeezing it, it just looks like a sponge, right? So you don't see what's inside the sponge. But as soon as you squeeze the sponge, out it comes, right? So pressure does that. Sometimes pleasure does that, uh, but, but what, you get to see is if we look back and we see the fruit, so we can, we can apply the fruit. So let me give you one. If you see a prophet or a teacher who is, let's, uh, we'll pick on televangelists for a moment, who's constantly begging for money and they've got a private jet and several mansions, you know, mm, that sounds like the hoarding wealth and the greediness, right? And so you get that, uh, you, you get to see that fruit and you're like, that is a false prophet. That's a false teacher. Uh, on the other end, you might see someone who does something that's wrong, 
because they're worried about money. So for example, it, let's say a preacher that maybe you're in dialogue with about the Trinity and Unitarianism. And maybe they even come to see the truth of that and they recognize, you know, I don't, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying, but they're unwilling to teach the truth because they don't want to lose their job. They're worried about their family where they won't have an income because they're, I mean, what are they going to do? They're, there's not a, they don't have a skill set there um, that they could just go get a job because they've been a preacher for the last 20 years. And so they decide, I'm just going to ignore that and consider that not important uh, because I don't want to lose my income. Maybe they don't say it that way, but you're seeing it in their actions, right? Well, that's the opposite one. That's not the greediness. That's the worrying about this life. So see the fruit? So you could take the Sermon on the Mount and you can see when the fruit is a good thing or a bad thing. Right? And then finally, he tells us, and this was our, our, our last piece at the beginning of tonight, you must act on Jesus's words in this sermon and all his others, by the way, learning, practicing, and doing them because ignoring them and not acting on them is the sure way to destruction in the judgment. You can't just hear these things and learn these things. I've known people who learn a lot about all this stuff and they can, they can tell you the gospel, they can do, you know, they uh, quote scripture and all this kind of stuff, but they're definitely not doing the actions of Jesus's teachings and commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. And so that's the sand. They, they're building their house on sand. It doesn't matter that they know all those things. James tells us, that knowledge, it, it doesn't help you, right? Because he says that the demons, they know who God is. They know who Jesus is. They know what the truth is. It's not going to help them, right? Because they're evil and they do evil things. So the, it, the knowledge doesn't help you. The action, it's not that knowledge doesn't help you. It can, but only if it's coupled with the obedience to the, um, uh, the sermon. All right. So being kingdom people who fulfill the law and the prophets, okay? I want to sort of encapsulate it in, in these five things. We need to go way beyond the letter of the law, understanding that true fulfillment of the law comes when we are willing to sacrifice ourselves for others, right? That's that first that those four parts, right? That how we do the Sermon on the Mount. First is we go beyond the letter of the law, understanding that true fulfillment is being willing to sacrifice ourselves for others. Two, we perform our righteous acts to please God, not to make ourselves out to look good in the sight of others. Three, we focus on God's kingdom not worrying about material things of the future, knowing that God values us and will care for our needs. Not being greedy, not hoarding, not worrying, not being focused on material things, focused on God. And an understanding, having faith in God, that he loves us, that he values us, that he's not going to let us uh, go without even if we might suffer, it doesn't mean that we're going without, okay? We can trust him. Even if I end up being persecuted to death, even if I get persecuted to death, is God leaving me um, just to die? No. no. Why? Because he promised to raise me from the dead. Jesus went to the cross, right, and died, but he went knowing that because he was dedicating his life to God, because he was dedicated to obedience to God, God was still going to take care of him, and God did take care of him. So we need to trust God in all things. We don't need to store up treasures on earth 
We can store up treasures in heaven. Again, it doesn't mean we don't work and all that kind of stuff. And, and if God blesses you with a, a bunch of material things, great, use it for his kingdom, right? Number four, in dealing with others, we seek God's judgment in our own, knowing that our judgment is likely hypocritical, right? That um, we always want to be seeking his, go down that, that middle path between our own thinking, our own judgment, where, yeah, we're going to be hypocrites, and not any judgment at all, which means we're just being stupid, and we're going, we're going to um, be trampled over uh, by people who uh, are evil. No, we, we want to use God's judgment, right? Finally, five, in summary, we treat others as we would want them to treat us, regardless of how they are actually treating us, right? So we always want to do that. We always want to be um, looking at how do I want, how would I want to be treated in this situation? And that's how I need to behave. All right, so I, I want to open it up and uh, we'll stop sharing here. I want to open it up to, to everybody. And if you've got questions, uh, thoughts, or uh, about the teaching, that's great. Uh, and we can do that. But I really want to, I, you know, I sent the, um, the message out yesterday that I, I'd really like it if, if uh, you, any of you guys would share on how the Sermon on the Mount has affected you, right? So as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, what has come up for you that you've thought, wow, okay, I need to apply that in my life? Because what we're talking about tonight is we've got to act on this stuff, right? So the idea is, how has it changed my thinking that has caused me to, to, to say, I, I want to go in this direction, not that direction. I want to do, right? So I, I want to act on something. And it may be, it doesn't have to be something that, well, I was, I was being bad and not doing something before. Um, uh, now I need to do that. It could just be, wow, I'm recognizing the importance of this act. I have been doing that act, but now I recognize the real importance of that act. And I really want to, uh, to make even more of an effort to do that. So it, does, it could be either one of those things. Uh, so anybody like to share on that? Stacy's got her hand up. I was like, wait, which button is it again? It's been a while. Um, so I think the thing that really hit me hard tonight, uh, well, two things, one, um, is the, the, the part about wealth. You know, a lot of times we think don't be greedy, don't hoard wealth, but you know, my situation moving cross country and trying to build a business now, you know, just taking a huge leap of faith. I have been struggling with that anxiety of, am I going to be taken care of? Am I going to be able to make money? And, and that is in the last like two weeks, I'd say has just been consuming me and I've been trying to pull myself out of that. Um, and so it's really good to have that reaffirm that like, that also is, is bad. You don't, you don't want to be there too. And really, you know, and, and for me with my business, I make the decisions on what I do every day. And so I have that panic of like, okay, if I don't have a transaction, I'm doing something wrong. I'm, I need to work harder. I need to do something more, you know? So I get panicky about how I'm spending my time. So this really affects me in that my time every day needs to be doing what God wants me to do and focusing on him, which is how I've been able to be successful in real estate is having that as my focus. And so this is just like a huge, like hammer reminding me that that needs to be my focus. And if, and if God and what, you know, he wants me to do in the, how I can, you know, do his work every day, that will lead me the path that I need and to not worry about being taken care of because God does know what I need. Yeah. You know, I, I've been in sales a long time. Uh, you know, I, I own my own business and when you own your own business, you're always in sales and, and, uh, um, and I have always found if I just apply what Jesus said, you know, treat others how I would want to be treated, which, you know, for me in sales means being honest, you know, it means, you know, trying to help them, 
but if I can't, not trying to trick them, you know, um, into to buying something from me that so I can make a buck and um, and 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 make some money, I, I always want to focus my thinking in that situation on how can I help them? Can I help them? If I can, great. If I can't, that's okay. Um, and you know, uh, so it. Uh, you know, I think that's, you know, we can always apply this stuff in every category of our life and we will be blessed for it. You know, and so that's, yeah, it, you know, yeah. in your work and in, in sales and real estate, absolutely. Yeah. And just remember, and that's, that's one of the things I love about being in real estate is because really I get to spend my time building relationships and being there for people. And I need to continue to not have the focus of, Oh, how can I build a relationship? so that it benefits me financially. It's how can I build a relationship to bless them and be there for them and do God's work with them and share the gospel and pray for them, you know? So really use it, continue to use it as my mission and not panic about if it's going to lead to money or not. There's a really great movie. If you've never seen it, it's called the flywheel. I have seen that. That was a long time ago. I got to watch that again. If you're familiar, you know, a lot of people have seen the Kendrick Brothers later movies, but they may not have seen their first movie. Uh, so, which is Flywheel. Which is Flywheel. So, you know, uh, what are, um, uh, what's the, um, what's some of the later, the latest ones that they've done that more people would recognize? Well, um, probably the big uh, the, one is the, Saving the Giants. Sa yeah, Saving the Giants. One, uh, the War Room uh, mm -hmm. is, is probably one that, you know, a lot of Christians would recognize. And, uh, but, uh, their first movie was the flywheel and what a great movie. And it's, it's about this that you and I are talking about right now where he's got a used car lot and he's, you know, he's a Christian, he goes to church, but he's cheating people constantly. And then he gets convicted by the Lord and, uh, and changes his ways and the Lord rewards him for it. It's, it's a great movie. It's really, really good. All right, let's go. Uh, um, the Pereiras were next up. And we'll go to Pereiras and then Sean and Michelle, then Laura. Uh, yes, John, the, the series on this uh, Sermon on the Mount was really a big blessing for me. Learned a lot of things. And um, I want to uh, say that about uh, the, the sermon about giving how our attitude should be when we give was very convicting. You know? That's something I want to remember where when we give, we should not have a selfish motive of, you know, if I give uh, and help someone, then down the road, I will be helped back from them. Uh, and, you know, they, they, I'll, be, I'll be also benefiting something from them uh, down the road. I think uh, that was convicting because that that shows that we are kind of still being selfish when we do things. Uh, but not to have that attitude. We just uh, we give and we help others just uh, for that only reason. So that that is something that has uh, really convicted me and helped me. I I have a I have a rule that I have, I have lived by for many years now where when someone comes to me and asks uh, for help and suggests it as a loan. Like they say, you know, it, you know they're, they're in need and they say, uh, can I borrow, you know, can I borrow some money? I, I'll pay you back. I, I, you know, I always take the attitude, if I have it to give, I'm going to give and there is zero expectation that uh, I, I'm going to, to require that back. And I tell them that, I, I, you know, no, I, I will not loan you money. I will give you money if I have it, but I'm not going to loan you money. You do not have to give me money back, right? It, it, you know, in fact, uh, because I know the Lord's going to take care of me. If you get the money back, I'd rather you find somebody else in need and help them, right? And so... The uh, yeah, I I I I I know exactly what you're talking about. There there have been times in my life where I've thought in that way, especially it, when I I was um, you know I was originally taught 
uh, you know, the word of faith stuff where if I give, then I, I'm automatically going to get from God. Right. So it's like, it's like this, this, it was like, um, some sort of, you know, exchange. If I give, then God has to give back to me kind of thing. And that's just a wrong attitude to have, right? That the idea is, no, I, you know, I'm looking towards God's kingdom and I, you know, if I have to give, I'm going to give and I don't need anything back. I, I, I know God's going to take care of me. I do not need anything back. And I think God loves that attitude among us, you know, because that's him, <laughs> you know, he gives all the time and doesn't expect anything back. Right. And, and, you know, he loves it when we give back our love. Um, but what are you going to give God other than that? Right. You're not going to give him anything except that. That's really cool, Rudy. I, I hadn't actually thought about that aspect of that. Um, you know, when I, when I think about that section, I don't actually think about what you're talking about. And that's really good. Um, uh, because I, you know, I think we generally have more of that problem than the one that Jesus is dealing with in that sub, it, you know, it, well, the, the aspect that he's dealing with where they're showing off to people, right? Motivation. Yeah. That motivation they're showing off to people, but you're right. Um, that, if we give expecting, oh, okay, I'm going to give to this person because I, 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 I know I'm going to get something back from them. <laughs> You've totally missed what he's talking about. There's some place where he talks about that. And I don't remember exactly right now where it is, but there's some place where he says we're supposed to give, not expecting in return. Yeah. Yeah. He what actually, is that? It's in the gospel somewhere. Uh, I don't remember. I guess I don't it, remember. Yeah, it has to be in the gospel somewhere. All right, let's go to Sean. Because it's Jesus talking. <laughs> uh, so I've been um, convicted tonight. Um, so thank you for um, this teaching, John. So um, just think about, about pride. Um, I recently, in the past few weeks, I feel like I have been, um, been wronged in um by someone um that um that i love and have helped a lot and i feel like this person has um wronged me and um and i feel like um you know well, i've done all of this for you and this is how you treat me this is how you repay me and i have been um convicted tonight that that's pride that is um, pride on my part to feel like um, I've done so much for you and then you wrong me and, um, and treat me badly and you hurt me and so I'm feeling like I don't deserve it and I'm I'm, um, I feel like that's a, that's a prideful on, on, my, on my part. And um, it's a gut, a gut reaction for me. I'm not sure um, how, to, um, how to change how I feel. Um, the only thing I guess that I can do from, um, uh, from this point is, um, number one, I, I recognize it. I recognize that what I'm feeling is not um, how Jesus would want me to feel and, um, and, um, that, um, I need to pray about it and repent. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, the really helpful thing for that, Sean, is the, the Jesus's summary statement at the, the end of all his instructions where he says that, um, you know, in, you know, therefore treat, you know, others as you would want them to treat you for this is the law and the prophets, right? That, that in those situations, so those kind of situations where you've been wronged and you feel a, a righteous indignation or a, you know, a desire, for, it, may, it may not be vengeance, but, you know, where, you know, you were wronged and you expect some sort of retribution. 
the retribution might just be your expectation of repentance, right? Which is a good thing, right? You, they should repent. But that feeling that you get in that situation where you have that strong desire, uh, where you want justice, right? It causes us to not do what he's saying, right? It causes us to not behave, treat others as you would have them treat you. We start treating them not as we would want to be treated. We're treating them out of that emotion of that righteous indignation. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think that, you know, you know I, I've, I've experienced what you're talking about. And uh, if I thought about it for a minute, I probably think, did I do the right thing? Probably not. I don't know. But but I think the answer is just thinking that last thing. Okay, I'm how can I treat this person in the here and now, not as how I think they deserve to be treated, but how I want to be treated. All right, let's go to Michelle. I wanted to say that this has been a really great series for me. I haven't been actively in each um, teaching, but I've followed them online, you know, on uh, on uh, YouTube and stuff like that. So I've listened to quite a few of the ones that I haven't been able to be present on. But it was a really great series. I really got out of it about how to be a kingdom person, how to have that mindset that Jesus was teaching. And, um, you know, he, and he had been, you know, he was and still is an example of how to be a kingdom person. So um, I really, I try to go through each day trying to have that mindset of, you know, the different things in this series, but, you know, trying to be a kingdom person, I, I, just that thought really um you know really helps just the thought of trying to you know enter into the kingdom by doing the things that jesus has taught us so that's all yeah yeah i'm right there with you michelle that's you know that's that's you know I think there's, for me, there's two things. I'll just real quick on one, and then I, I want to wrap up with the other one that one of the big things that stood out for me was the same thing, you know, just the idea of, oh, what, what does a kingdom person look like? I want to be like that. I want to be that kind of person. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Laura. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that was a really good wrap up, John, um, just to kind of remind us of what all we talked about. I think the more I think about the the stuff for the Sermon of the Mount and I've just kind of been doing different things lately with working with people in my internship and just been thinking about these things that Jesus tells us to do. And um, one of the thoughts that came to mind was um, that being allegiant to Jesus, um, being a kingdom you know, a kingdom person is way harder than, than, um, I thought it was going to be, I guess, even though I knew it was hard. Um, but also when you really think about all the points he makes that it's really hard to do. Um, it's not, it's not something that's going to come natural to us, but, um, at the same time, I've been just, I don't know if it's just the Lord working with me, but I, I just feel much more equipped and able to actually do the things that he is calling me and all of us to do. I feel like it's easy to not have a lot of confidence um, and say, oh, that's so hard. I don't, I don't think I can do that. You know, that's so countercultural, you know, um, to love your enemies. And um, one of the things that's been helpful to me when I think about, oh, I'm like the only Christian here working with these people and they don't, they won't understand me as I kind of get to the point where I'm just like, well, good. I'm glad then somebody here needs to be a light, you know? And so I try to think of things that way, like what are other people's needs? Um, And, you know, I think that's what, what Jesus wants us to focus on. 
um, and letting him kind of fill our needs and then so that we can focus on, you know, helping others and um, that we won't, we won't get so upset when they don't treat us the way that, that we want to be treated or that we think we should, because we know we're doing um, th what for them, what, what we would like for us. So maybe that will hopefully make a difference in their lives. So that's just kind of some thoughts I had. Yeah, that's really good. That's, that's what it's all about taking the focus off of ourselves and putting on loving others, even if they don't deserve it. I, I had something. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think um, something that, that stood out to me about all of it is that the whole thing, it's all about relation, our relationships and our relationship to God and our relationship with other people and that we're um, in our, in the right place and our motivation and our actions and our hearts and minds um, in those things. And so um, as we studied it and went through it, you know, really seeing that and getting it has helped me to be able to, um, you know, as things happen in my life, you know, practically ap apply it because, you know, as I'm doing that and things come up in those regards, I think of this, all of this that we've learned and I've asked myself, you know, how am I doing, you know, in that regard in my relationships, you know, am I, you know, is, is the way I'm dealing with this, am I being gentle? Am I being humble? You know, am I being giving? Am I being forgiving? Um, am I loving my enemy? Am I being obedient, you know, to Jesus's commands about, you know, a relationship with others? You know, am I relying on him? Um, you know, and uh, how that might intersect with how I'm dealing with others, like, you know, um, something other, other people are doing, I might react um, in a certain way um, because I, uh, how it, you know, I, it makes me have, you know, fear, concern about certain things in my life. And then I realize, well, I'm not really relying on God, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and doing that, you know, I need to trust him and not be concerned about what other people are doing and just everything, you know, if I just keep, you know, do that, I've just seen that that really seems to be kind of what it boils down to is relational, you know, relationally being, being, being right, being fruitful relationally the way that God wants. And, you know, if I'm thinking about that as I go along, you know, the things that I need from this that we learn kind of come to mind and then I'm able to apply them. And, um, you know, sometimes when there have been, uh, you know, situations where it really bothers me, um, you know, spending time, I've, I've had some times where um, it really helped me a lot, you know, to have some quiet time where I, there weren't any, any distractions where I could pray you know, ask the Lord to help me as well as going back and in, in the sections of scripture and reviewing some of the stuff that we've learned. So that's. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. Uh, um, that's a good practice on, on this is just to kind of go back and reread, you know, not frequently on you know the the sermon on the mount and jesus's other sermons and just meditate on his instructions mm -hmm. yeah i think that's 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 good to do and it's powerful and you know obviously we need to act on them but it's hard to act on something if you don't have it in your mind oh and what you were saying about um when you were talking about the don't ask don't, or seek uh, and ask and knock and that being in the context, you know, of all of, all the things in the Sermon on the Mount, which are how do we deal with people, how do we treat people, and and that kind of stuff, um, you know, that was a new thing for me, and that just that really, I think that had a lot to do with kind of the light bulb going on that the whole thing is about 
relationally with God and relationally with people, you know, doing things in the right way. So praying and asking for wisdom, you know, that's, that's part of the thing with the, the prayer time and taking time where I'm not distracted. If, if something's going on with a situation with people or whatever, and it's challenging and it's bothering me, it's troubling me and maybe stirring me up or whatever, um, you know, asking God for wisdom about how do I be a kingdom person in this yeah. whole thing. Yeah. It's good. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Edgardo. Yes. Uh, the Sermon of the Mount helps me a lot because it teaches me, it teaches me to continue on reflect Christ through my doings. Because the Sermon of the Mount shows us the attitude and character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the kind of life that we are trying to imit imitate. So this Sermon of the Mount, when we are ministering to other people, could bless other people too. And that's why it is very helpful that we understand uh, all about this teaching of about the Sermon on the Mount because it helps it helps really and uh, people could feel that we are really living a kingdom life because they could see the example of it in our life so so thankful to it because it's really so enlightening and helpful uh, we will be able to uh, evangelize more people disciple more people if they see that we are applying the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount in, in our life. Thankful, so thankful to the teaching, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Edgaro. Yeah, that's just good. It's just good stuff. And, uh, you know, it's good to know, but it's better to do. And so we need to know it. We need to do it. The one, um, I, the whole thing, like Michelle talked about, just really the whole time I was thinking, okay, uh, this is a kingdom person. This is what a kingdom person does. This is what a kingdom person looks like. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to uh, think about. You know, this is how I want to act and kind of thing. But the one that just, you know, really floored me was I, when I was, I was studying, I got to teach on the section on murder. And I never had seen before what Jesus's real message was in that example that his message really wasn't about, you know, don't murder. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about, I had always thought of it as Jesus is telling us not to be angry, you know, with our brother, right? That because that's, that's the same as murder. If we're angry with our brother, and I always, I, I had known for a long time that it wasn't just fleeting anger, you know, it was lingering anger, but that, that that's the same as murder. And that's the lesson that I took away from that. Mm -hmm. And as I was studying it, and I, I was, uh, one of the things that I like to do when I'm, when I'm studying through a section is I'll, I'll ask questions of the Bible, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly asking, what, what are you saying to me right now? You know, what does this mean? And how do these things connect together? And I, so I'm constantly asking questions. And when I saw that in there that the, it said that when you're going to give your, your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, you know, it was like a, you know, just smack in the face realizing, oh, wait a minute, you're not the one who has the anger, the brother has the anger. Well, then what the heck does this mean? And at the, the moment I realized that what Jesus was saying, um, was he was telling us to go save our brother you know to, to that that was his point you know his point wasn't about the murder and the anger stuff his his point was that if you have that you're going to go to hell so if your brother has that against you go save your brother that's what a kingdom person does right go do whatever you need to do to 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 get them out of that contemptuous anger so you rescue them from hell. And I mean, I, I was just floored 
and I choked up, I nearly cried because I saw just how much greater Jesus's heart was than I had ever recognized. And, uh, you know, and it, and it sort of, it was, a, that, it was kind of at that point that I went, this sermon is way deeper than I've ever really thought. And I need to really pay close attention to everything that he's saying, or else I may miss it. Because I've read that verse hundreds of times, and I never saw what he was really saying. And so, you know, going back to, to what you were saying about, you know, meditating on it, I think is really, really important that, that we take the time to learn what Jesus is saying um, in the gospels, in his messages and his teachings and his commandments, and that, um, and that we spend time meditating on them so that we incorporate them not only deeply into our thinking, but deeply into our behavior. Well, I'm going to, to close out the recording uh, on that note. Um, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed. If you've watched the whole series, if you haven't watched the whole series, you need to go back and watch it. It's really, really good. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to tap my own horn. Yeah, I, I taught a few of the, the sessions and I learned a lot from those, but I learned so much from everybody who taught on it and all the comments afterwards and the discussion afterwards that were, you know, really helpful and thinking uh, about things. And, um, uh, you know, I feel like it was a really good series. And so if you haven't watched the whole series, you know, I really encourage you to go back and and, uh, and, and listen to the series, watch the series, and, um, and hopefully it's blessed you. If, you uh, if you've watched the series and, and it did bless you, we'd love to hear about that in the Allegiance to the King Facebook group. So if you're not a member of the group, um, you know, uh, you know, go to the group page and ask to become a member of the group. And there's a little a uh, couple of questions that, that you need to answer and, uh, and then we'll put you in the group. And, and we'd love to hear what, um, what your thoughts are. You can put it on YouTube as well, because uh, you can put comments down on YouTube if you want to put some comments uh, in this video about how this has affected your life. We'd love to hear that. We'd love to hear um, how Jesus's teachings are affecting our lives to make us more like him, to encourage all of us.